Hey, what's up? This episode of Sports Debate Tuesday is brought to you by NY Varsity Sports, the Option Podcast, and Endless Summer Beach Volleyball and Beach Volleyball National Events. I'm Jason DeBeers. This is Rob McLean. Let's get to it. Let's run it. Come check out the Option Podcast on OptionDB.com. It's also available on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube under the NY Varsity Sports handle. You're going to love what you hear. Hey, what's up? Once again, Jason DeBeers and Rob McLean, and I'm also with the great, great Miranda Gagne, the hostess with the Moses, our tech girl. Tech girl, you got questions, we got answers. Let's go. All right, let's get it started. The Houston Rockets have gone small ball since the Clint Capella trade. They've lost their last two. Can small ball succeed in today's NBA? What do you guys think? So um, <clears throat> I think everybody understands that it, it won't work. Uh but um, I, I, it's kind of just crazy how they made the trade. Like, if you think about anybody saying, I'm going to trade away my, my center and just go full out small ball. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you could just so, press record twice on that. So it's like, it's kind of it. crazy because the, the Houston Rockets, man, they, they always are known to make the trades. You know, Daryl Moore is always, you know, about making that biggest trade, making the, the you know, the best people best best uh possible move to make their team better but man that is crazy having pj tucker as your center six five pj tucker seven foot wingspan man it doesn't matter unless you're over six eight if your wingspan's over seven foot you know like six five that's great on the perimeter but man you cannot do that like they got out rebounded by 12 last week like last game like that's that's there's just certain things that the, the game of basketball needs you know you need to rebound you know as good as your perimeter defense much you want to spread the floor and have his great fl- uh, fluid offense and all this transition game yeah i understand that but you still got to rebound you still got to control the pace of the game you know you can't just run 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 you know and that's what people miss about the small ball warriors the small ball pistons is they were about defense and they were about shooting and, you know, offense and, and making their thing happen, controlling the pace, whether it was slower or faster. They were about defense and rebounding way before they were about uh, how many shots I'm going to throw up. And I'm going to take away my center to throw up more shots. Even even the Golden State Warriors weren't about that. They are about getting their shooters the ball. But, um, yeah, that's just that's crazy. Absolute F. That's terrible. Yeah, well, listen. Rob McLean, I, the only reason why this even came up, but let's let's be frank, the losers of two of their last three, and now all of a sudden the panic buttons hit because you lose to this the Celtics by one point. You lose, you know, you beat the Lakers, and then you 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 drop to someone else. Uh, the team escapes me right now. Um, I like the concept of small ball, but I'm going to co-sign on what you said in regards to um, to. Uh, uh, it's about clientele. This wasn't the team that plays defense on, you know, from uh, on both, on, you know, both ends or full court press or half course. Or uh, then, then they weren't a terribly good defensive team to begin with. So it worked for the Pistons because they had short guys. But as I said before the podcast, Rob, those short guys were dogs. You have Isaiah Thomas. You have Dumars. All right, Bill Am- with Bill Ambeer being the only tall guy on the podcast. Uh, um, excuse me, the only tall guy on that team. Um, they had to rough some people up, and and they did so so much to a point that the flagrant foul was invented because of teams like them and let's not forget the new york knicks at that time i don't even want to mention knicks right now i might jinx the podcast i might, I might, I might lose power we just, got uh, a new president. <laughs> we just got a new gm so you know maybe new things will happen you know? so here's the thing I, I think it'll work and i think the whole concept and their level of thinking was if we take four threes and they take four twos we're more we're more than likely to score nine points and, and they're going to score six or eight so but once again rob mclean it's about clientele you got the golden states warriors using steph curry is a a, a pretty good perimeter defender uh, um clay thompson is a is a, um, a hard working perimeter perimeter defender also the guys that anyone would consider undersized like draymond green and at the time iguodala was iguodala's a, a hoss i'm not going to use him but guys that are like six eight guys match up against seven feet guys those guys were um exceptions that rewrite the rule you know, you um, Charles Barkley, the Sixers had a pretty small team. You had Manute Bowl and some of these guys. Um, so, you know, big man centers that can rebound. But it was all about being able to keep people out of the paint 
and it was all about being um, ferocious at the perimeter. And right now, neither Westbrook, neither James Harden, uh, um, and no one on the team per, uh, plays particularly well uh, perimeter Defense, defense. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, to answer your question Rob small ball would work if um, if it's about the clientele I'm, I'm, I'm going back to that but I mean even with the, the right clientele I just don't think small ball works I mean D'Antoni has tried this throughout his whole career you know even like they're saying this the Suns you know the Phoenix Suns small ball Amari Stoudemire they had like a but he wasn't really even a shot blocker an intimidator you know I think the biggest thing is uh creating a presence you know what i mean whether you're big or you're small if if you create a presence on the court or on the on the basketball court or volleyball court you can be that player right mm. so like, let's even bring up volleyball like uh, one of my favorite small blockers is pedro mm. you know, from brazil yeah and unbelievable he creates a presence yep. on the net you know yeah. what i mean whether he's big or small he creates a presence so like you know, you can have a bigger guy that might cre- seem like a bigger presence, but he's not a good block. So, you know, he can't, you know, uh, affect the game the right way, the, yeah. the way it needs to be affected. Right. right. But no matter what, in basketball, if you got height, you can rebound. That's yeah. it. You know, yeah. it's just you can play defense. It's, you just stick them under the rim, and you're not going to get easy buckets. That's the whole point of it. So. Yeah. Well, for me, it's one. Uh, I just want to correct what I said before that I thought they lost to the Celtics one of the last three games, and I'm looking on my feed. Thank, thank you very much, Miranda Gagne. Um, they lost. They'd beaten the Lakers, and then they lost to the Suns convincingly. Actually, it was, um, boy, we got the brakes beaten off of them. That was 127 to 91, and then recently just lost by one point to the Utah Jazz, a very formidable team. And I like your comparison with volleyball as far as. Um, um, uh, mo- mo- uh, hybrid mobile blockers uh, that there were examples of, of people that worked and how clientele is but mm-hmm. volleyball I think where the rubber meets the road is lately they've been if you have a skill player and you have height they're, they're going to choose height because they're in their heart of hearts strongly believe that they could teach the, the big guy the same type of skill and then and, and, and we've seen so many times how that's fell on its butt um and that's that's uh, honestly that's that's where I want to finish with this. I don't even know why I brought this question up. <laughs> to, to, to Miranda, 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 did you did you come up with this question? Yes, hundred percent. Ah, next question. Interesting. <laughs> okay, John Jones this past Saturday beat previously undefeated Dominic Reyes by unanimous decision to retain his light heavyweight title. So, Rob McLean, did the judges get it right? <laughs> um. Yeah, so for me, I I personally felt that they got the decision correct, not the score, but the decision. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, yeah, you know, for me, and a lot of people do say this too, and, and I'm not saying the scoring is right, but they do score the championship rounds heavier. Um, you put out a higher output uh, in certain rounds. I do think that certain rounds were debatable um third second you know reyes is a quick starter he got his quick start we were talking about this uh, before the flight oh yeah heck yeah quick start on the last episode of the podcast rob absolutely right yeah you know and i think uh dana white kind of said the uh said it the best where everybody expects that either guy is going to come through the fight and and roll through that then you're kind of you're not really understanding the fight game. You no, know, they they, they yeah. both knew they were going in for a war, and uh, either however they however easy they talked on on one another, they knew they were coming in there to fight and, and to have a, a great fight, and it was a great fight. Um, I don't think that it was so decisive that Dominic Reyes should have won. Uh, I think it was really close. It could have gone either way, and it did go some way. And in my eyes. When it comes down to a championship like that, it has to be you got to either put out the champ or you have to be no scratches and that guy is busted up because judges just don't give away championships to challengers. It just doesn't happen. You don't give away. you got to take them. So that's just the way it is. That's the way I've seen it. So what do you got, Jay? <laughs> Rob McLean. Mm-hmm. You said a whole bunch of things mm-hmm. in your little diatribe on this on this on this match, and I thought they were well thought out. Don't get me wrong, but and I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Mm-hmm. But I have to start because I have to get this off my chest. And let's start where we in we in a place where we agree. Whatever judge 
thought that John, Roan, John Jones won four rounds to one needs to be fired, okay? Uh, for those of you guys that, guys that are uh, watching the UFC and be like, oh, the UFC judges suck. I, for, um, for, uh, I don't like to use the word casuals, but for the people that don't follow the sport as avidly and understand how it works, because that's also connected to what we're talking about, um, the judges are not assigned by the UFC. The judges are assigned by the by the, the athletic commission or whatever state is mediating and navigating that. This is a Texas uh, athletic commission. They assign the judges. The UFC doesn't get to even pick the referees. So they're the one that mediated because it's a combat sport and it's for, for fighter safety. They're just trying to make sure that we're um, literally not the wild, wild west. So don't blame Dana. Blame the Texas athletic commission who today on a report said they were unapologetic and um, they put out an article on why they made they came to the decision but because they didn't say sorry I didn't read the decision <laughs> I didn't read the story <laughs> all I wanted to hear was sorry first and then we could read it now with that being said Rob Rob McLean mm -hmm. it would be nice to say that John is, John Jones finished John he did it would be nice to say that the champion uh, won the championship rounds in convic convincing fashion he did It'd be nice to go back to those pride days where, like, if there was a six round and discuss the hypothetical, like if John Jones won, if there was a six, he probably would have finished him. He might have. But that is not how the rules of mixed martial arts works. Dominic Reyes, I believe, strongly won the first three rounds. There might be a dispute on, on, on I think one of the judges gave Jones the second round. The other judge gave round, um, the other judge gave Jones the third round. And that's how they came to that three to two, the four to one. We're just not going to talk about it anymore because we got that off our chest. Um, if someone wins the first three rounds, mixed martial arts is scored by the rounds. So unless you were, we're going to make an argument that round four or five was a 10-8 of uh, John Jones, which someone, uh, someone, one of my peers brought up, which I um, um, adamantly disagree with, because if someone tags you back, or um, it's not a 10-8 round. If if you take someone down and you start elbowing him and eventually he gets up, yeah, get the 10 in. But 10-8, John Jones took him down, which counts as points. The guys got back up, which means John Jones wins those rounds. But I will not make the illogical leap to 10-8. To My opinion, I believe this, this, this man, uh, won the first three rounds. It is also my opinion, and this is where I think, Rob, you're going to agree with me. I don't think he got robbed. I, Rob? Rob, don't think he got robbed, okay? Um, uh, I don't think anyone got screwed. I think one, uh, one of the rounds, I give uh, probably round two, where he was ahead, and then John Jones started, you know, started uh, tagging him. If you look at this, I'm going to show you the strike stats. You can take a look at that while I'm done mm -hmm. rambling. Um, you will see a stat that's that has head strikes, um, leg strikes, and all that stuff. I'll leave it right there. Um, Miranda, if you can, I don't know if you, you can find this or pull this up at some point uh, while we're discussing this. Um, where is it? There's head, body, or whatever, and and they have all the strikes by the round. Um, Yes, yeah, so it is my opinion. If I were a judge, I would say Reyes won the first two rounds and as dominant as John Jones was at the last four and five rounds. Uh, who looked like the real winner? Who looked like the winner? John Jones. But by the rules of mixed martial arts, who won that match, I have to say, and I have to put my foot down, I have to say Dominic Reyes. Hey, man. Definitely agree to disagree. <laughs> yeah. It's a good discussion, though, isn't it? Yeah, man. I mean... So watch, listen, while she's looking for it, let's talk about something else. Um, do you, um, what do you think John Jones is a, um, where, where does he go from here? Does, does, does um, Dominic earn a rematch? Does John, um, who wants to be an active fighter, does he uh, wait to see who wins between Stipe and Daniel? Which I got to, I think I got to well, change that because I think that Stipe is hurt right now. I think he's going to go up into the, to, to yeah. the uh, heavyweight division just because he's a bit more limber. He can move around a bit more. Yeah. But my question to you would be. Please. Do you think that John Jones is losing a step or do you think he is uh, falling off? I mean, I, do you think that the rest of the division is catching up? I think you mentioned something last week about him being safe and i made the argument that that's that i think that may be true but i also think because there's a big old sam sample size on video and his tendencies and what he likes to do i think in this world where where coaches are who are not 
working a nine to five at, at, a, at, a, at a, 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 a law practice and doing this part time where coaches are doing this 24 seven. I think I think just like the major sports, people smarten up. People smarten up. We're not going to use the Super Bowl as an example for smartening up, okay? Because that that was just someone out, out thinking himself. I just think people smarten up. It's on UFC.com. So that's where you get it. Um, and um, so to answer your question, did John lose a step? I don't know. And I, there's no evidence to, su- to suggest he, he did. Could he have? Yes. But the evidence is not there because nobody tested him. But I will tell you this. And this is—I suspected this all along. The dude has a chin. Rob McLean, he got jacked up, <laughs> and yeah. still, and still kept uh, um, that uppercut, Ooh, and still kept pushing the pace. Right into the mm. yeah. Mm. How much did I remind you a little bit of uh, like Floyd, like just dominating the center of the ring, and and he, he's taking hits, but he's pushing the pace. Mm-hmm. I mean, Dominic Reyes was very tired by the end of the fight like the fourth and fifth round and and this is why like and no one's really fought this this idea is where uh i don't think i think that john jones could have lost the fight because of he should have done more i felt like as a fan he should have done more with what dominic reyes was giving him in the fourth and fifth. agreed yeah you know let's go that's down. where my is he's playing safe you know where he doesn't I've never seen an offensive explosion from him in like two, three years. You know, it's always just a tick tack, tick tack, tick tack. Like he never, and he talks about not all oh, like I'm so I I don't I don't I wanted to finish somebody and I and I <clears throat> and I just didn't like get the chance to finish him and you always look for the finish but you don't get it. I don't feel that anymore. You know, right. I don't feel that from him. He's just he. There's never a strike. There's never a. Uh, an actual thing that he does that's I feel like is going to knock somebody out. He right. may have the tools to do it. Mm-hmm. He may damage to people, and that's what he does. He's damaged yeah. them. To and he and he will take his shots. Can you um, exactly. scroll up? Scroll up. I want to see. But it's almost like he's 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 okay. A little more. He's uh, devolving into his wrestler mindset. You know what I mean? Where he's like, I I could fall back in the wrestling, or it just I don't know. It just uh, yeah. I feel like he's maybe got to break out of whatever. Maybe Jackson Wink box he's in yeah. and get to a different mindset. Just open up his game again because his he just looks very stiff and very o- over calculated. Right. Right. Like, and and that ra- that's a, that's what raised the question in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. Oh, it makes complete sense, Rob. Uh, yeah. For me, um, once again, um, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but I think his 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 leg kicks and body kicks and his dexterity, as far as that concerned, looks it looks oh, looks looks me. looks nice. His striking, um, like <laughs> what did Je- Je- Rampage Jackson said he couldn't bust a grape in a fruit fight. <laughs> so he's never been one for this this knockout power. Though if he does catch someone, yeah. his ability to rain down on people, rain down the elbows, and 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 like like he did to Daniel Cormier. Well, I just think um, there's a, there's a there's a technical ability to to any sport, and then there's like the get like what you'll what you'll actually put into it uh-huh. you know because you could swing perfectly in volleyball but if you don't put a hundred percent into your swing it doesn't matter they're still going to be able to dig the ball agree right? so you know the same thing with but, the punch like but it's, Santa uh, but but a hundred percent yeah but but you know, by that rationale volleyball sometimes your technique and your contact uh, maybe your swing starts slow and it speeds up. Is it one of those things where John, um, his technique gets stronger as the match goes? The answer is no. no. It's the same. It's it's, it's, a, it's a flat exactly. line. And that's why we're talking yeah. about it because yeah. it's not something that improves or evolves. Yeah. It's something that, you know, he's basically making stay still because nothing stays still. Yeah. But he looks the same in the in the fights, so that means he's forcibly you're, making it. Happen. I mean, Rob, if he goes to the heavyweight division, you're going to see a lot a lot more of his wrestling. I know, um, and and it's yeah. highly underrated. That man's the JUCO champ. You know what I'm saying? Um, he, he's he's taken down Cormier. Well, he's he's you know he's taken down uh, Chael Sonnen. He's 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 really good, man. That's why I would love to have seen him uh, go offensively into on on the ground a bit more in some of his fights. Even in like even in Ta- Tiago Santos fight, like just being more aggressive in, in, on your ground game to set up all the things you can do on your feet. You know, agreed. Yeah, that man, so. I, and yeah. So, so to, I guess your answer, basically your answer is right now is you're saying that he um he might just get his next match. His next match might be heavyweight, right? I think I think yeah. he has to. I think what I think he has to find something different yeah. because these guys are going to catch him. Yeah, 
Like, yeah, because Derek Lewis, I mean, I know he's got a chin, but no one want to find out if Derek Lewis, Lewis hits you. Which, by the way, I think is a match that John can take to the ground. Exactly. Uh -uh. That's he, why he ain't, ain't going to find out. Like Daniel Cormier, when he fought Lewis, he got rocked by one of them shots. Yeah, he ain't want to find out. Anthony Rumble Johnson. Like, <laughs> he, hit, he hit Daniel Cormier so hard, I thought, I thought Daniel Cormier got shifted to a different weight class. I was like, he's going to fight Mighty Mouse next after this. Well, I mean, What's up? Stipe, when he fought Nugano, mm -hmm. like, he got cracked yeah. one time. And then he's like, I'm just going to put my hand on the back yep. of his neck and keep him on the ground because if I get hit by one of those fridges, the, hey, he's got a fridge. The smartest fridge way man. I've ever seen someone fight oh um, um, Nugano. The smartest way uh, the, uh, out of all of his matches, Derek Lewis, and, and I don't even people people remember that Derek Lewis fought oh him gosh, and Nugano. Everybody, I just forgot about it until you brought it up. <laughs> I'm sorry, because we're supposed to wash those things from our memory. That's probably <laughs> we ain't the having most faints without a punch in a fight I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> just, like, faint, uh. <laughs> no, oh my God, ah, jeez. Nobody wanted to swing it out. Yeah. So with Stipe hurt right now, and Jones wanting to stay active, and with other fighters like Johnny Walker lost a bad one. Johnny Walker mm -hmm. looked like he was on his way up until. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think if he stays at two hundred five, he'll fight Corey Anderson? Who's that? A Jones? Yeah. Corey's looking good right know, now, dude. I know. I really like Corey Anderson. Me too. Because. He kinda, he's also has an axe to grind too that's what i mean and, yeah. and he's a wrestler as well a really good wrestler a yeah. guy who won a lot of his fights in the beginning by wrestling and just beating people up which is what i'm telling you is like what john jones needs and i'm not saying that jones for me john jones is a fantastic defense like a standing defense to get to the ground I really haven't seen much of his ground game in the ufc he may be a, a juco champion but right Look at Ben Askren. You know what oh I mean? My God. Look at like, and there's nothing against all these wrestlers, but the M MMA forces you to evolve from that person. So it's great to have that as your base, as your starter. Yep. There's a reason for that, but like, it, you're not doing that anymore. You know, so it's like if you don't do that same stuff yeah. all the time, you're gonna lose it. And I think. Yeah. You know, well, I mean. I mean, Rob McLean, and these, these days, you're not going to find someone that's... You're going to find someone like Askren or whatever that has a strong suit in wrestling, but as far as complete mm -hmm. fighters are concerned, there's just too many of them. There's too many. But, and it was only a matter of time before Askren ran into a complete yeah, fighter. Yeah, oh my I gosh. mean, I, honestly, he should have gotten... Yeah, that. They could have easily stopped that fight against Lawler. He could have been... He could have, he could have been Owen. He's 1-2 in the UFC. He could have been 0-3 right now. Let me tell you this. If... if Masvidal happened before Lawler, and mm -hmm. then he was getting ragdolled like that in Lawler, they would have stopped that fight. Yeah. But because Ben Askren had never seen that type of stuff before, they mm -hmm. let it roll, and, and he got back, and blah, blah, blah. But if if he had gotten just five seconds by Masvidal and it came back, and then that's how that fight looked, they would have stopped that fight. But he got dropped on his head. <laughs> Because <laughs> he was getting dropped on his head, and then he was getting... Oh, Lord. Oh, oh good. Good Lord. So, uh, here's my opinion. If he stays in 205, I think he fights Corey Anderson. Um, when the Athletic Commission refused to give him his license because of the picogram thing, mm -hmm. um, they moved. Dana spoiled John Jones to death, and he moved the fight to California in six days. And Corey Anderson... You know, had to move his whole family, not just that, relatives who paid for hotels. So even though he got compensated, his family members and and close friends had to basically either not go or pay their way again to California. So it's just like, uh, you know, there there is maybe there's some envy there or, or some some tension and some frustration that came from that which is like where Corey's like man I would love to fight this dude right now so so it's that so I say if he goes to heavyweight he's going to want to fight soon and it'll probably be Cormier uh, 3 because Cormier is healthy right now and he's not going to want to wait around for Stipe either um, yep hey, man. how we feel let's, how we feel about that wrap that up let's make it happen yeah. alright Miranda my hostess with the mostest let's go alright rumors have been circulating that the Dallas Cowboys have been interested in Tom Brady the question is, <laughs> who is a better fit for Dallas, Brady or Dak? Ah, it's like this. I hate the Cowboys. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to get yeah, I, I, I look, look, hey, look, I, Rob, I threw up in my mouth a little bit when I heard, when I heard, when I heard the, the name, okay? The operative word wasn't traitor. The operative word wasn't humor. The operative words were Dallas Cowboys. So oh. let's just get through this. Trying. <laughs> Rob, 
It's like this. I said a week ago. Remember when you were like, nope, nope, nope. Remember I was talking last week about, I said, um, as far as like pass protection, as far as having a running game or and Amari Cooper and actual people to throw to. Uh, I wouldn't want him to go because he's my favorite quarterback of all time. Tom Brady's my boyfriend. Um, but... The rumors started with Michael Irvin, and then Michael Irvin on Twitter had to walk it back and said, "No, I didn't. I didn't talk to anyone from the Dallas Cowboys organization about this because usually when Michael Irvin says something like that, everyone's like, oh, my God, he just talked to Jerry Jones, and this is going to happen.' So, so he he had, he had to nip that at the butt. <laughs> um, but if the question is who's a better fit for the Dallas Cowboys right now between Dak Prescott and Tom Brady? Rob, I'm gonna have to go with Dak Prescott. Mm-hmm. He's younger. He's got a, he's got an upside. He's got a future. Um, and everybody, when everyone's citing as a pretext uh, on the field leadership, all Tom Brady's is on the field leader. Dak Prescott is a leader. Dak Prescott grabs people by their collar and says, "Hey, chill. We still have a match to win." And they don't bu- they don't bow up to him. The dude is is has been asked to do so much in such a short time. Reminder: He's only been in the league. Um, you guys message me maybe five years, uh, um, um, and has been asked to be a to be a leader, and he's done that. He's kept all his promises. Now I could sit here and talk about eight and eight, eight and eight. How about them Cowboys? Eight and eight. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I could do that all day and feel good about myself ad nauseum and have the haters hate because that, that's what they're calling me right now, a hater, of course, with the New York Yankees hat, which, by the way, is the most celebrated franchise in all of sports. Go kick rocks. Um, but Gotta love it. I will not let me being my, my contempt and me being a uh, uh, be uh, allow me to be a prisoner of the moment. I, we got to do some critical thinking here. So got to go with Dak. Dak uh, was top five in quarterback rating. Completion percentage is pretty good. Fourth quarter drives, uh, um, his his rating and his and his numbers just go up. They don't go down, particularly when they're behind. Oh. Um, and the only reason why this is even a discussion is because they gave everybody that money except Dak. You gave Zeke the contract. You gave this guy the contract. Give Dak his money. Okay, you're going to get Brady. Even if Brady gets you to the playoffs, you are the Dallas Cowboys. You are an accident waiting to happen. And even Tom Brady can't save you from that. He cannot save your soul. Not go now. to the man Go to the man that, that went through all the ups and downs for you, okay? Because he, 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 he stayed up when you were down, and he should sure as hell stay up when you're up. It is Dak Prescott. So... <laughs> It's going to be about <laughs> how much is it going to cost? <laughs> how much is it going to cost? That's the problem. Uh, Dak Prescott is going to want a long-term contract. Um, and for me, when you have the talent that Dak Prescott, Prescott has, he's going to get severely overpaid. It's like I don't want a Kirk Cousins on my team, and I, this is bad because I I would love for the Cowboys to suffer for as long as they could possibly suffer. Yeah. The way that their fans are, they can suffer for all time. Yes. But if they want good advice, you got to get rid of Dak Prescott, and it's unfortunate because I love drafted players. I love when you draft a player. It's really hard to get rid of them because you've done it. You know, most people always either throw it in your face or you you, you didn't have a good guy or you didn't really make it out or he's he's not going to really make it to something. But he Dak Prescott is actually that guy who is going to sink your team because he's going to have too much money and he's not going to allow you to make a better team. I would love for Tom Brady if I if I was in the position of general managing the Cowboys. I would take in a Tom Brady for a one or two year deal. And what Tom Brady brings is a, a presence. Kind of like we were talking before, not necessarily a physical presence, more of like a metaphysical presence. Right. But he brings that presence to a team that could potentially grow to a bigger way. Like they they have so much talent and they're not performing. You know, so you need to bring in more of a superstar, kinda of like I don't want to bring it up, but Mookie Betts going to the Dodgers. They don't need Mookie Betts, but they need somebody to spark the program to get to not only the playoffs, but to win a championship, right? So I think the same things with the Cowboys. The funny thing about what you're talking about is 8-8 eight and eight, is they shouldn't be 8-8. Eight and eight. <laughs> They should be 10-6 and six every year. You know, 
with the talent they have, with the with the resources that Jerry Jones have, like it's ridiculous uh, how Miranda, they're in it. you know. Told them was like, and can then, you pull up accident waiting to happen? You too. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. And then you have, uh, and I hate to say it, how Jason Garrett's now the offensive coordinator of the freaking New York Giants. I really, <gasps> yeah, you don't know about that. Oh, oh my god! They they just brought on like six new coaches, basically all head coaches that were previously. We got the freaking you, guy from uh, the Browns, bro. Do you think they're grooming What's his him? Name for the do you Browns? think they're grooming Garrett Kitchens. for the Kitchens? Wait. We got Freddie Kitchens, man. Oh, uh, for defense or offense? I think defense. For head coach? Uh, no, who? offense, 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 uh, offense. So who's the head coach? Um, what the hell is it? Uh, the dude from uh, the the Patriots. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, Joe Johnson or something. Yep. Or yeah, Joe I like him. I like him. I like him a lot. Yeah, but dude, you can't bring on six hundred head. I mean, I guess you can because if you think about, it, look at the Browns back in the day with Belichick. And then all those guys became head coaches other places, you know. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing, but one that got that young we'll, we'll head coach has to manage, and and two, sorry, I, this is off track. But, no, this is this is football. Uh, but um, so Jason Garrett was horrible as a head coach, just as Freddie Kitchens would have done the same thing if he had four more years to do the same crap with the yeah. same team, right? Yeah. So Jason Garrett was terrible, and everybody was joking at that, and then eventually just became the eight and eight talk. The thing is, they should have been ten to six in the playoffs for many years, and then either crash and burn from there. But when you're eight and eight, you don't know. You yeah. could be, you couldn't be. You don't want to read through, like go through a whole rebuilding process. They have the best I, left tackle in the yeah. league who can't stay healthy. It's just. I mean, Amari really Cooper, difficult. he can catch <sighs> ten balls and then catch zero. And zero on you the know. first third down. You know what I mean? No. It's just, uh, it's now, Rob, if this were a year ago. Hmm. Or two years ago, with Jason Garrett still the head coach, make mine Tom Brady, because Dak Prescott, as much as I said about his leadership, it wasn't enough. They, you know, because right. when they're losing and the defense is getting their ass kicked, that's not a, a it's not a quarterback thing. When kickers miss their kicks, or special teams is a, is a disaster, that's not their thing. When Dak is handing off and Zeke or or whatever multi million dollar man is not getting runs, that's not a Dak Prescott thing. So it's one of those things where. If Jason Garrett was still there, make mine Tom Brady. But now you got you got a, a very capable leader, uh, um, uh, someone that's particularly uh, good at handling strong personalities. Uh, McCarthy, who uh, who um who was with um the Green Bay Packers. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you got Brady. I got Dak Prescott. Let's <laughs> hey, let's play the beginning of this clip. I hope they don't take me down for this, but I got to. Go ahead, let's do it. They're gonna be able to hear the music. This is accident waiting to happen. There's a black cat running around that franchise. Hi, that's good. Tony Romo and oh my gosh, at the back and stuff. Can't with the because it all started because he missed the handoff for the field goal. Yes, way back when. Well, he was the um. He was the he was the, he was the holder yeah. for Bledsoe. And then he and then Bledsoe got hurt, so he became the starter. And then he was also holding. And then Bledsoe Bill was hurt. and Bill Parcells went cheap. He's like, nah, we'll, we'll uh, still let him hold. hold. Uh-huh. And then and the then last, he... most of he scores a touchdown. They come down, and then he can't hold for the. Other Do you think that's where the jinx started? I just think, and it's not even the jinx. It's just like. When you do things, you know, that's that's you. That's what you've imprinted on yourself. So you have to do a lot to, re, you know, it's, it's not that we're all going to have, uh, that we're never going to have failures, but do you rise from those failures or do you fail more? You know, and that's just, I think he was a person who failed more in those, because I think he did amazing in the regular season, but when the pressure hit, those yeah. same things came out and he never really, you know, exor- you know exercised those demons. So. Hey, man, we're going to get into a discussion about the Giants next week as they continue to put their, their parts together. But for now, Miranda Gagne, mm-hmm. my hostess with the mostest. Let's go. Okay, we're going to turn to beach volleyball for a little bit. As the time period for partner shakeups comes to a close because the season's about to start, what's the most interesting partnership that you guys have seen or heard of so far? There are some pretty cool ones, and... Um, and 
I'm so glad we're talking about this because this start, you know, this is an offspring from the Option Podcast. I want to um, address, um, before I start, I want to address someone. It's like, why do we keep changing the name? That's Shane's joke. And Shane, the answer is we're not changing the name. This isn't uh, the Option Podcast. This is called Sports Debate Tuesday. And it was an offspring from that. So this is something we're going to do every single Tuesday or a day early because Rob, Rob McLean uh, with Platform with P1440 has an Intra Squad tournament at Huntington Beach tomorrow. Mm-hmm. All of you guys come through man it's gonna be fun it's fun to watch Huntington Beach tomorrow morning um so yeah so we didn't change the name uh and Ken Bassarat that thought STD meant something entirely different from Sports oh, Debate man. Tuesday I love you very much and when you come to California uh you're more than welcome to come on Sports Debate Tuesday as a guest Can and definitely Kenny. and definitely come on the Option Podcast as as just <laughs> As just a, as as a pure episode, because you, man, do man, do you have some stories to tell? And I would love, I would love to have you on the podcast. And with respect to my volleyball brother, you would definitely generate more views. Um, so, um, with that being said, the AVP. Um, I'll start first. Okay. I uh, saw a bunch of good ones. Saw Troy Field was gonna um, uh, hook up with um, Casey Patter- um, Patterson, mm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the Olympic run. Apparently. Dave Lee. Don't know who he's running with yet. But the one that generated interest and has just happened, I just figured this out yesterday. I was, in, um, I was on the beach hmm. getting my butt kicked by a bunch of 50-year-olds. And they're like, oh, man. All my partners are like, oh, I'm sorry. I wish we could have won that. And I'm like, dude, if I wanted to win, I would play someone younger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll technique them to death. So as I'm going through the strand, passing by, saying hi to people I know and people I love, people that love me. Miles Parchain's out there. Big Pearl, big up. I run into Ty Loomis, hmm. and Ty Loomis is playing with Ryan Doherty. Yeah, I think I saw that the other day. And that is my team of interest. Ty Loomis has been a very, very good defender behind Madison McKibben when they won the AVP two years ago in San Francisco. Or, wow, actually going on close to three years ago. Um, Ty Loomis was a great hybrid blocker defender with other partners that you've seen him play with in and out. Um, uh, Brunstein, I think they split block a little bit. But Ty Loomis finally has a giant at the net that he can not only play defense behind where some of these plays where he works a little bit harder and stabs his gas tank comes a little bit more easier. And I'm so, so excited to see him play with uh, Ryan Dougherty. And I'm, I'm so excited. Um, he's, a, he's agreed to come on the podcast. And he's always my, one of my more fun people. And um, Ryan Dougherty actually actually lives in the area. You're more than welcome to come too, buddy. buddy let's do it. Let's do it. Rob. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was actually on the other beat on the beach the other day. I was watching uh, Miranda play a couple of volleyball games. That's and, our uh, hostess. Right? She's a b- baller. A baller. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and I saw Bill Kalinsky, and I heard that uh, I was asking him who he's playing with for the season, and he said he's playing with John Hyden. So I heard them there are uh, <clears throat> teaming up for the season, and I thought I was fantastic because. Yeah, John, uh, I would just love to see John play with somebody who can uh, set the ball kind of where he wants it uh, in transition as well as inside out. Um, So I think he was trying to do a lot of movement and uh, and trying to, you know, evolve in the game that's kind of evolving, you know, around them. You know, I feel like the game has kind of been really stationary for a while and now it's it's really evolving very quickly, you know, uh, maybe two or three years ago. It was, you know, all about the setting and, you know, like running a play. And now it's just like you run a play almost all the time. If you can, uh, if you can't, then, you know, you're slowing it down. But the game is really fast now. Um, And it's just great to see. And I would love to see how somebody with a mind who's had a lot of experience, who's played two different, like, decades pretty much of volleyball, try to evolve and, and, and grow in the game. Yeah, I'd say a couple of decades of beach volleyball. I mean, yeah. uh, as far as decades of volleyball, we're going we're going close to a th- three and a half. Right. Um, indoor player, ninety six Olympics. They called him Whiskers. <laughs> had a little beard, looked like a sexy Jesus. Um, so, I like the team for one reason, uh, but I I think their strength might be their weakness. Uh, one of Hayden's biggest strengths, and you might you might agree with this and interrupt me at any point. He doesn't have a lot of wasted moves. Mm. 
um, his ability um, to make one move to the ball and and his ability to read hitters, a uh, hitter's body language and event and 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 how he takes that body language and responds off the contact is amazing. The dude just doesn't, he doesn't have any wasted moves. Um, I see him play a lot of Todd Rogers style volleyball where I, it looks it looks like he's cutting a foot off of each side of the court and if you hit it you could have it, meaning if you're perfect. He'll lose to you, but if you're anything other than perfect, you won't. Meaning if you're good, you're going to lose. If you're very good, you're going to lose. If you're great, you're going to lose. If you're phenomenal, you're going to lose. No, you have to be perfect. So, And I like that game. And I, But by that rationale, I also think that that's, um, that's going to be the weakness of this team because Bill Kalinske has pulled out a lot of wins with players who do take that extra step and, and can cover that perfect shot. And in some of these games, and, and you, you, Rob, you see the gap, right? There used to be this team, that team, but now you're looking at these three setters that are 16, 14, or some of these, these, these first and second setters that are 24, 22. The gap is closed so much with some of these kids coming up. Uh, it's because they, for some reason, I, I don't know if it's an evolution thing or, or like you said, or just a father time thing, they're, they're catching up um, on coming up with digs that John Hyden um, will not come up with. So... Um, is this team a top five team? I don't know. What do you think? Kalinsky and um and Hyde. <clears throat> I just think there's a lot of teams. Uh, I think there's still going to be a little bit of movement. Um, uh, I, I'd have to see like a list in front of me. I mean, I like their experience, and I think experience goes a really, really long way on the beach. Uh, at being able to maintain a high level and then not have to mentally maintain that high level you know i think that goes a really long way um mm. so i think also uh you know being crafty on getting people out of system you know being able to set up your system in a certain way that affects the game i think again massively impacts the game so i do i, I think they could be a top top five team sure Especially yeah. the U the U.S. top five. Yeah. Uh, they oh, we're not the talking US. about the world team. We're not. Yeah, no. I'm saying the U.S. Come top on, five. I'm in a good mood today. <laughs> don't make me don't make me do that to nobody. <laughs> I mean, it really depends on how they click together. I think if they side out, I think they could create a system um, that could easily mimic uh, John's defensive game because uh, I think Bill's a really really smart technical blocker, and that's the exact kind of uh, blocking that you want. As a, as a player as John so I think it actually work out really well as long as they set out I like the I like your pick yeah. I like your pick look Bill Kalinske you know, one of the nice guys at beach volleyball right you want right. nothing but nice things for that guy right. um, I mean he's spent a lot of his career doing more with less and I'm not yeah. casting any aspersions on Eric Baranek I mean after all they are the team <laughs> that went through the qualifier in Manhattan Beach and made all the semifinals and beat my guy over here Rob McLean to do it in Rob's defense Unlike unlike most of those teams, Rob at least took we took first set. <laughs> um, I was on. I was actually. Yeah, was I was actually game. on the sideline. I was under the umbrella for you on that one, man. We we were just trying to figure out ways to to beat that team, and that was really cool. I th to me, with respect to the Aurora in the third set, uh, Kalinsky and the Aurora got a lot of the serves, and Kalinsky came up with these big little clutch kills, and Aurora just missed some. And that's sometimes you play a team where everybody's evenly matched. Um, that's what happens, you know. I thought you and Baranek were evenly matched, and I thought Rob played over, uh, Dioro played over his head. Um, and man, think about that one, huh? Yeah, it's, that would have uh, been, yeah. It's funny, I haven't yeah. thought about that in a while. No, you're, you look, you're on your way, man. That's that's the team that made the semifinals. Mm -hmm. Case Beer and Shock, they, 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 they you, look to make the semifinals in Manhattan Beach a gold series. You have to, you have to chop down some trees. There's no, there's no easy path, you know. And they lost the first round uh, to Rafu and Ed, um, so they did that out of the contenders bracket. That it's is just, crazy. that's just sick. So for my volleyball people, um, um, stay with me on this. I know you you want it's a sports debate thing, and you thought I'd be talking more about volleyball, but even volleyball players talk about the Super Bowl. Even volleyball players talk about the NBA, and yeah, got a ton of volleyball players who have MMA fans, and and that it is sports debate Tuesday, not volleyball debate Tuesday. But as the season comes, and as if IVB shapes up from these three to four to five stars, and pretty much rolling into Huntington, the, I think I think the first uh, AVP tournament. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, expect a lot, a lot of that. And for the people who are watching us for other reasons, stay with us. Volley, beach volleyball is an absolutely fun sport, as is indoor. Yeah. Miranda, what do you got? You guys ready for the controversy? 
Okay, the last episode of 30 for 30 was an inside look at Michael Vick. With his stint in prison for animal abuse being a huge asterisk in his story. The question is, was this something he can never come back from? It's a weird question. Yeah, let me let me let me talk about this. Take it in. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, Michael Vick, man, really really sad, <clears throat> really really sad story because um, it's it's really crazy because I was talking about this the other day, like you don't realize how much of an impact he had until he went away, and. I look back at it because you, you, you're you almost made to forget it. You know, they don't want, you know, the NFL never wanted anybody to, you know, you don't want that, that stain, because it is a stain. You don't want that on the shield. But Michael Vick, man, they, I feel really bad because it was, it was like the, it was like the, the, the start of social, social justice, you know, key, keyboard, keyboard warriors where, you know, PETA was all over, you know, people who love animals. And I understand that, but they were all over Michael Vick. And especially when he got out of prison, you know, I understand making him pay for the deeds that he's done. But what is paying? You know, if if you pay, yeah, you know, <laughs> and then you have to pay again and you have to pay again and you have to pay again. You know, one, you're not even allowed to get frustrated then. You know, two, you have to continue. Like, when does it end? You know, when do you stop paying? You know, like. And I'm not saying that Michael Vick should you be wrong. Wikipedia and even though he, his, uh, career. even though Michael Vick went into, you know, the NFL again and played again, he was not the same player. Right. And it was different. Yep. And he maybe he could have spent eight years, or he could have spent five years in prison after his career. You right. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I just don't get why. It could. It, 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 you, like I. And again, I understand, but. He was never given the chance, even after he got out of prison, to have a clear name and and to go on living his life because he created a great legacy. He created a great uh, life outside of football past his mistakes. You know, so what when when does you know when do you when are you allowed to give a second chance or how far does a second chance go? When do you do you actually give somebody the chance to find forgiveness or? Will they always have that stain on their on their reputation? You know, I mean, and I think it can go both ways. But I, I wouldn't look at him a different way. If he's no. my friend, I wouldn't look at him a different way because nope. he grew up in a certain environment and had to learn the hard way how to change. Right. You yeah. Know? We all going through life of find a different path towards uh, what makes us whole. So, you know, if he continues doing it, there's a problem. You know, but if he stops doing it, you know, it's and to me, and and to me, consistency is the key, Rob. Mm-hmm. Consistency is the key. Um, and I said this on the on a previous podcast, and I think I said this on Sports Debate Tuesday last week. It's very um, easy to take someone. At, it's like you could. Pull, I think you could pull up dirt on anybody, right? It's very easy to take someone's whole life and just take and just take their worst moments, and then put those in, up 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 on Front Street. And then just cut out everything else and then use that to identify that person as a collective whole, as a collective body of work, okay? Um, and I think that's unfair and that's BS, but consistency is the key. Are you that same person from 10 years ago? Are you that same person from five, five years ago? I'm not even that same person from yesterday. So um, I want to talk a little bit about Michael Vick. When I first saw Michael Vick, and, and I'm the one that introduced this title, this topic, um, when I first saw Michael Vick, I didn't follow him through high school. I followed him co- at college, um, uh, Virginia Tech. He was electrifying. This man's arm throwing 60 yards and, and overthrowing people. Um, the way that he leaves the pocket, it looks like a combination of design play combined with running for your life. You know, it's almost it's, the way he runs. It's almost like he's saying "ref, blow the whistle" and <laughs> just dodging people and they're missing him. And I find it fascinating that, and 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 I'm gonna bring it back. So bear with me. And I'm also looking at um what he was suspended for and stuff like that. But I find it fascinating that prior to his suspension, it's the 2006 season. He was he was he was just amazing. He ran for a thousand yards. He had uh, 20 total touchdowns. You know, ran for two through through whatever. I believe got him into the playoffs that year. 
and then this whole dog fighting thing came up. So he was suspended by the NFL, violated their conduct policy, and I put that in quotes. Um, spent time in a federal penitentiary. I mean, hard time. You know, paid paid the price. Two full years. Paid the price. You have, and it's crazy because you have people in the NFL that beat up their wives. You have people in the NFL that have that have murdered. You have people in the NFL that have raped. Literally. No time. And say at the same time. No, no time. This in, in the NFL. This person, I don't know. I, I the charge wasn't cru- cruelty to a domestic animal because that's more of a state thing. This is a federal crime. This is a ring that they busted, and he was part of the ring. And I do think he should pay the piper, and I do agree if it's a federal crime he got to do federal time um and we're not going to get into the whole topic of disproportionate sentences for for some people and slaps on the wrist for others um, i do have to respond to that after that. please no, let's do it now so <clears throat> what i what i mean by that is i feel that as though there's not many people in this world who have the uh, opportunity to make the money that he does so it would make a lot more sense if he had a punishment that could actually help move forward yeah. instead of destroy the lives of those dogs and destroy the lives of him and his family and his well-being. So if he could find, if there, you know, I'm just saying like to think outside the box with punishment instead of just saying, well, he's just going to lose everything. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, that's smart. Or he could donate half of the salary he's going to make for the next five years. Yep. Do you know what I'm saying? Be a superstar player. Be somebody that's an advocate for dogs and, 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 and animals around the planet. Or destroy his life and make him the news outlet. You know what I mean? It's just like it just doesn't make sense. But sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, actually, that was part two of my, my little um, soliloquy here. Since he's gotten out of prison... Nothing but the man's with the human rights, um, not human rights campaign. That's completely different. Um, animal rights, every uh, major animal rights thing, any uh, human rights thing. He's been touring and he's been talking about the importance of taking care of of our animals. He's rescued dogs from shelters. Uh, um, um, he's um, helped house abandoned abandoned animals or, 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 or animals that have been abused. The work he's done since he's gotten out of prison, I will, I'll be so bold to suggest that he has been more of an advocate for animals than than the ASPC than 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 animal lovers have. He has done more since his since he's left, and he left federal prison with nothing. His his account was minus a thousand dollars. You guys gotta watch that thirty for thirty. He lost all of his money. Uh, the guaranteed contract, there, there's fine print that if you do this, you lose your guaranteed money. So when he went to prison, the, he lost a ton of money spending it on his lawyers, this and that. And um, big up to um, Tony Dungy that just said, hey, this kid talked to me. He looked me in my eye and I believed in him. And I think he deserves a second chance. Now, from a football perspective, he did. The first two years back, he did exercise that second chance. His, his best career um, yeah, year in his career, was I believe it was 2010 with the Philadelphia Eagles, passed for 3,000 yards, threw 21 touchdown passes, ran for nine, uh, ran 676 yards. I, and we were, as Giants fans, or I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, but as Giants fans, we, we definitely remember yeah. some of the stuff he did on uh, to us when he was up, and then when that game when he was down 24-3. Uh, remember Jason Jackson mm-hmm. returning that punt for a touchdown with no time left on the clock? It. It's ridiculous. Well, Whoever punts in the middle of the field deserves whatever they get. So that was a bad, <laughs> bad um, Tom Coughlin thing. I can't Gosh. believe we get back to New York teams. Uh. I'm sorry about that. So the question is, can Michael come back from that? My the answer is he's already come back from it. There are going to be people who are animal lovers. I have close friends that have pets, and they're like, that is the most unforgivable sin. You, you could chop my finger off. Okay, we'll put it back on, you know. You could shoot me in the shoulder. Walk it off. Be a man. But you, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you F up a cat or a dog or whatever, and these people, I have friends that are cat lovers, have a house full of cats, I have friends that are dog lovers. There is no, this, it is the most unforgivable sin from them. And for them, I'm saying, okay, cool. That's unforgivable. You, you can't, they, um, and as far as him redeeming himself, there's nothing he can do. That'll make you say he's coming back from that. But for the other people who believe in uh, um, uh, um, the intervention of forgiveness and the path of redemption, for the people who believe that that the death penalty shouldn't be for every single mistake, for the people that um, desperately want to believe that you're not you or us as individuals are, are improved versions of ourselves if we were good human beings and ultimate reversals when we were bad human beings, this is your man. 
This is your man. He's come back. He's come back on, on the football field with a vengeance. He's come back off the field uh, with a vengeance. And Michael Vick has redeemed himself. To quote that song, I'm coming home. I know my kingdom awaits. They've forgiven my mistakes. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Tell the world I'm coming home. Mikey Vick, baby. Now, wow, Miranda's like, dude, shut off the camera. That's what we're gonna. This, this is how you end up. This is like, how you end the podcast. Should I start playing some music or something? Um, no, but I, at, at the very end, I do want, want you. Piano? I do want you to run my thing again at the end. The uh, the promo thing. Uh, For sure. We're gonna do it at the beginning and the end. Um, but hey, Rob, anything else you want to add to that? Ah oh, man, Michael Vick. Yeah. No man, I just he's just such an incredible player. He he came back. And, and like, pff, damn, for three, four years, you know, they, they moved on from Dan, Donovan McNabb because, yeah. you know, he was there. That's crazy. Yep. So, yeah, I was just, yeah, Michael Vick, man, favorite player. Because lefty, too. Yeah. You hey, know, lefty's a genius. Lefty, yeah, yeah, man. Yes, they are. This guy here, Rob McLean, is ambidextrous. Hits with both hands. If he hurts you with his left, go down. I'm really lefty, but, yeah. Oh, you are? Yeah. You're right with your left. Yes. Good. I get to call you a genius. Yeah. Uh, well, Miranda <laughs> got it right, didn't she, huh? Yeah. If you're not a genius by the time you're 30, make sure you're married to one. Right. Um, well, with that being said, we're gonna hey, we're gonna skip the pet peeves this week. We'll do that in episode four. Um, for all of you at home, I thank you. I'm eternally grateful for you tuning into this um, this branch off from the Option Podcast. This is Sports Debate Tuesday. That is Miranda Gagne, my, t- my hostess with the mostest. This is Rob. Keep him McLean McLean. I am Jason DeBase. And for everybody else, I say I love you. So long. Come check out the Option Podcast on optiondb.com. It's also available on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube under the NY Varsity Sports Handle. You're going to love what you hear.